welcome everyone today to um, the final of this three-part series that we um, were lucky enough to pull together. Um, and uh, we welcome everyone far and wide to this one. We had a large group of folks register this time. So we'll see it as you come in um, who is able to join us today. The, today's webinar, uh, our focus is really narrowing in on the Northwest for all you folks in Washington State. And we're really lucky to have Michael Chang and Cheryl Manning with us. And I'll, I'll introduce you to them shortly. Before I go really any further though, I wanna make sure that we acknowledge that um, wherever you are, you're on the land of a unique tribal nation. And um, what's really great is that as science teachers, we're really fortunate that the guiding document um, for us all, the framework for K-12 science education, intentionally acknowledges that there are other ways, there are other ways of knowing. And we were able to focus in on this in the first of our webinar series, which is available online to listen to if you're interested. Um, and I encourage you to check that out. I will be sending links for that later as well. Um, before I go any further though, I wanna give an opportunity to the folks in Washington to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about why this webinar series was developed. Take it away. Hi everybody, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Ellen Ebert. I'm the Director for Science and Environmental and Sustainability Education at the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction in Olympia, Washington. Today we are not in Olympia, we're in Seattle, so and we're happy to report that we have blue skies and sunshine. Um, so I want to just quickly say some thank yous uh, before we get started. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to the Washington State Legislature for providing the one-year funding for the Science Climate Science Education Initiative, which we have affectionately named Climb Time. Uh, I want to thank my Washington team of Amber McCulloch, Science Specialist at OSPI, and Drs. Phil Bell and Deb Morrison at the University of Washington's College of Education. And a big thank you to all the people who are behind the scenes at OSPI helping us to um, support uh, the Climate Science Initiative. Uh, thank you to our 16 Washington State projects and their respective team and all the work that they're doing for science education and climate science education across the state. And then our very warmest thank you to Kristen Poppleton of Climate Generation and Frank Niepold of NOAA for your generosity of time, critical thinking, and collaborative friendship throughout this process. And thank you to our guest speaker for today, because we are indebted to you for bringing the Pacific Northwest into this conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure working with you all. Um, as Ellen mentioned, this um, webinar series is really a product of a collaboration between NOAA's Climate Office, the Climate um, and the Climate Literacy Network, the Clean Network, and Climate Generation. And um, just before jumping into the rest of the webinar, um, we wanted to take a quick moment to highlight some of um, the partnerships. So I represent Climate Generation. I direct, I'm the director of programs there. We are a nonprofit that focuses specifically on um, engaging individuals and their communities in solutions to climate change. And we see climate change education as critical to those solutions being realized. Um, we have a number of resources available um, including curriculum collection, a network that meets monthly to discuss climate change fiction books and challenges, um, virtual meeting that is. Um, we also provide professional development uh, through webinars such as this, but also through institutes and workshops. And we will be putting on our 14th uh, Institute for Climate Change Education this summer in Washington, D.C. And I will include some information about that in a follow-up email. And uh, I really appreciate you all being here today. And our other partner in crime here is uh, Frank Neopold. Frank, you wanna take sure. this part away? Sure, so uh, I'm really happy to be here and I love this partnership. This is, the, this is a great opportunity between NGOs, science institutions, education providers, 
uh, plus uh, federal science enterprises. So it's, it's, a, it's the right kind of mix because this issue requires that mix. So just to remind you, uh, at NOAA, we have a climate priority, a goal uh, of an informed society anticipating responding to climate and its impacts. That in order for that to occur, education across the 15,000 school districts is required. That's part of our mission. We are legislatively mandated to do this. Uh, and so in order for us to take such a large, large uh, issue uh, and, and move it into the education system with support, uh, you need some, some partnerships. And so what we did, one of the things we, we found is, is that um, uh, you need a weaving together of resources. So one of the ones I love to end as an entry point is this one, the toolbox for teaching climate and energy. And because we went through a long process in the clean community to figure out what are all the pieces that sub needs, teachers need support with in order to teach climate and energy topics. Uh, and it's substantial. And there's a lot of different partners who bring excellent pieces, but until you start weaving those pieces together, it's really hard to find them all. Um, so this is just a one place to start. It's not the only place, but it's a nice place to start. Um, and today we're gonna be focusing on the second box on the, on the uh, climate action learning process, which is the uh, building confidence and gathering knowledge and insight specific to the Northwest. But you know, there's a lot of different pieces in there and that's where the National Climate Assessment, which I'm a, a member of the steering committee for that product that was released back in December. That's probably enough. I could talk for a long time, but that's not the point today. So thank you for being with us. Sorry, I couldn't unmute there for a minute. Thank you so much, Frank, for joining us. Um, and just to follow up, we'll be hearing a lot more about the CLEAN collection, but CLEAN is um, another part of this partnership. It's a network that meets weekly, as well as a collection of resources and a place where you can um, suggest your own resources you might know of um, already. So um, encourage you to uh, check them out and Cheryl sure, will be going much more in depth around the CLEAN collection. Uh, well, before we jump into introducing Mike, our, our speaker, um, I wanted to go back to, uh, as I mentioned, this framework for K-12 science education, the, the basis of um, NGSS, and highlight really the importance of us here today um, focusing on local climate science and um, the local impacts of climate change. Um, because really what we know is that for students, um, really need to be building on and revising their knowledge and abilities, starting with their curiosity about what they see around them. And I really love this statement because um, the world around uh, us is really what sparks that curiosity and thinking about the phenomena that's happening there and um, the foundations of knowledge that students have, their conceptions about that is a great starting point. And so focusing specifically on the Northwest for those of you in Washington is, is just really an exciting opportunity for us all today to hear from someone who really is an expert in that area. Um, and so with that, I wanna introduce our speaker, our first speaker today, Mike Chang. Um, Mike Chang is the climate adaptation specialist for the Macaw tribe. He has led the Macaw Tribe's climate impacts assessment and coordinates the climate adaptation and resiliency planning process across tribal departments and the Macaw Tribal community. Mike also supports the tribe by participating in various state and regional marine planning groups and is working on a tribal land policy tool for natural resources managers. He is an author for the Northwest chapter of the recent US 4th National Climate Assessment where he focused on highlighting climate impacts to tribes and indigenous peoples, cultural heritage, and frontline communities. He received his master's from the University of Washington School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and Mike, give you the opportunity to share your screen. Perfect. And um, I'll be taking questions um, at the end of Mike's presentation. If you have one that's burning and you don't want to forget it, please feel free to include it in the chat box and we'll follow back to that. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Um, 
Well, so uh, again, um, I'm going to be presenting on uh, the fourth National Climate Assessment, which was just released um, at the end of 2018 and specifically focusing on the Northwest chapter. Um, even though I'm the one presenting today, there were uh, the writing of the chapter was a collaborative process with uh, 12 authors total representing all three states of the Northwest, um, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State. So first of all, um, just some background context and uh, the development of the fourth National Climate Assessment. So the fourth National Climate Assessment, or NCA4, um, really stems from uh, the mandate from Section 106 of the U.S. Global Change Research Act from 1990 to prepare uh, essentially a climate assessment every four years known as the National Climate Assessment. Um, to this date, obviously, there are four iterations of this. The first one was published in 2000, the second one in uh, 2009, next one in 2014, and the most current one um, published at the end of 2018. Um, the fourth national climate assessment is a little bit unique from its previous three counterparts in the fact that it was developed in two specific volumes. Volume one was uh, called the Climate Science Special Report, um, and are the CSSR, which provides the climate science, the models, and serves as a foundation for many of the climate scenarios developed to inform volume two, which focuses on the impacts, the risk, and the adaptation actions within the United States. And so going over a timeline, again, this has been a multi-year process starting from 2016, um, including convening the Federal Steering Committee, um, recruiting authors and developing six different drafts, um, including multiple agency reviews, including reviews through the National Academies of Science. And so again, I'm just focusing on the Northwest chapter today, but if you're really interested, here is an overview of all of the chapters in the most recent fourth national climate assessment. And so you can see here, it's broken up in both national chapters and regional chapters. So national chapters are each about six pages long, and they really focus at the national scale of uh, the Im climate impacts to each of these sectors. Um, and then within the regional analysis, this is really where the bulk of the information of each chapter will be. And so each chapter uh, covering a region is, deep, is about 20 pages. Um, and there's a lot of regional roll-up into the national sectoral chapters. So there's a lot of cross-referencing between chapters just to ensure consistency and examples across all the chapters too. Um, if you're familiar with the NCA process, there are some new changes in, uh, with the region chapters, including separating the US Caribbean um, separate from the Southeast chapter. And then it was the Great Plains, but then it was divided into the Northern Great Plains and the Southern Great Plains too. Um, and so here is the entire author team. Um, and so the author team for the Northwest chapter really represents a diversity of expertise and people. All three states had representatives. There is a combination of federal and non-federal authors representing a lot of academics, researchers, state agency representatives, and tribal nations. And so again, one important thing through the development of NCA4 was having these regional engagement workshops in order to engage stakeholders across the entire region um, to see what was important, what was crucial, what was valuable um, for communities, and what was to be represented in the fourth national climate assessment. And so for the Northwest region, we had two regional engagement workshops, one in Portland, Oregon, and one in Boise, Idaho. And so, uh, through these regional engagement workshops, we really found that our key messages, which are the key messages and key points developed through the writing of the chapter, should focus on not so much the physical science impacts, but what are the climate impacts on Northwest residents and the communities and the things that they value. And so one of the things from each regional engagement workshop, there was a report written up documenting what was talked about um, in the breakout sessions. And so from the report, we developed this just general word cloud about what are the words that came up the most often. And again, you can see that people in the Northwest really wanted to focus on uh, climate impacts within their communities into the things that they value. So again, uh, 
even though we're now we've refocused at least the Northwest chapter and at least NCA4 broadly focused on impacts, risks, and adaptation actions, we still had a brief overview of the climate projections for the Northwest, um, what has happened and what has continued to be projected. So here's just an overview um, of generally the physical science impacts relevant to the Northwest region. Um, the Northwest region has warmed substantially since 1990 and will continue to warm across all seasons under all future climate scenarios. There will be less winter snowpack in the mountains and more winter precipitation in the form of rain. There will also be increasing intensity of summer droughts and wildfire risk due to increasing temperatures. Warmer ocean temperatures, ocean acidification, and sea level rise are rapidly changing marine systems and coastal areas. The frequency and intensity of extreme events, especially in the winter, will increase. And overall, we use kind of 2015, which was kind of a year of climate extremes, as an indicator of what's to come in the future. And so kind of using the foundation of all of the physical science, we really kind of came up with these five key messages focusing on the Northwest's natural resource economy, the heritage and the quality of life within the region, uh, the infrastructure, transportation, and systems uh, that support the Northwest, uh, the health, social systems, and healthcare of communities, and overall frontline communities, uh, communities that are often experiencing the first and often the worst effects of climate change. So we have these five key messages, and we really wanted to emphasize is how is a key message developed? And so within each key message, there's a background and state of the science of what's out there. Um, a clear connection between observed risks and impacts and potential benefits and projected risks into the future. So what's been already happened and what's projected to continue to happen. Um, and then we also had sections addressing emerging issues and research needs. And also with each of these key messages, there's an entire traceable account. So that is separate from the actual substance of the chapter in itself. And it provides kind of this uh, roadmap into how each key message was developed. It highlights all of the citations and references pulled to support each, uh, essentially each statement within the key message and a whole list of references related to each key message itself. Um, so this is just trying to demonstrate that the process of developing a key message is pretty rigorous and robust, and it must be uh, rooted in within the literature that is available out there. One other thing to mention, um, and that you'll see uh, in the upcoming few slides, is every single key message has a confidence level and a likelihood associated with each of the statements. And so confidence levels range from very high, high, medium to low, and likelihood goes from very unlikely all the way to highly unlikely, very likely. And so um, these statements are used and they're again uh, pretty uh, standard in their definitions. I think the IPCC also uses the same definitions within their reports. Um, and this is just a way to measure again the credibility of what is out there and the confidence and likelihood that we can associate with each of the statements we are making. All right, so the first key message, um, I'll just read the entire thing out loud. Climate change is already affecting the Northwest's diverse natural resources, which support sustainable livelihoods, provide a robust foundation for rural, tribal, and indigenous communities, and strengthen local economies. Climate change is expected to continue affecting the natural resource sector, but the economic consequences will depend on future market dynamics, management actions, and adaptation efforts. Proactive management can increase the resilience of many natural resources and their associated economies. So we really focused a whole key message on the natural resource economy because agriculture, forestry, and fisheries account for about 700,000 jobs and more than $139 billion in sales um, across the Northwest region. In addition, outdoor recreation generates about $51 billion of revenue in the Northwest, which mostly benefit rural economies. And so what we've already seen is that low snowfall years result in both fewer people employed and a net loss of revenue for ski resorts um, across the region. In addition, tree mortality driven by wildfires, insects, disease, 
will force timber managers to shorten rotation rates and affect the other types of forestry management practices. And warmer river temperatures and, and other ocean changes such as ocean acidifications and warmer ocean temperatures will increase the likelihood of species mortality, abundance, and the predator prey distribution and timing um, in the ocean. And so in this figure, you can really see the percentage of state total sales. So um, of both jobs and sales revenues uh, that the natural resource economy plays within the economy of the Northwest region in general. And so uh, in talking about future climate change relevant to regional risks, um, there are things of, such as irrigated productivity is projected to increase demand, um, which will be sensitive because timing of water supplies because of snowpack and earlier declining snowpack and earlier snow melt will shift the availability of water supplies. There's also impacts of phenology, um, which will increase the quality of fruit, produce, and livestock, which will have cascade cascading effects for the farmers themselves and their livelihoods and the prices that they're able to sell um, their produce um, at. Uh, in addition, there are varied responses of forests due to combination of increased carbon dioxide, which, such as longer growing seasons, reduced seasonal precipitation and moisture. And forests more, most at risk are the dry eastern northwest forests in eastern Washington. This will most likely affect timber supplies and depress timber prices for the region. Commercial fisheries will also be adversely impacted by ocean warming, acidification, and harmful algal blooms, which will lead to the increased frequency and intensity of fishery closures along the Northwest coast. And again, um, even though there is a lot of things happening, there are challenges and opportunities for reducing risk. So such as, uh, for instance, shifting plant hardiness zones will change historical and current uses of certain locations. So an example of this is that the Northwest wine industry has been growing a lot over the past decade, mostly because warmer temperatures are more favorable to great, different types of grape varietals. However, wine is also, uh, the wine industry is also challenged by the shifting hydrologic regimes. Additionally, Every single national forest and park within the Northwest has a vulnerability assessment and a climate adaptation plan that is in progress or has been completed. However, there is uncertainty about short-term versus long-term adaptation solutions, especially pertaining to commercial fisheries. And in this picture, you can see an example of adaptive climate adaptation actions. So using this uh, strategy called uh, allowing farmers to plant crops instead of leaving fields uncultivated. And so uh, you can see specific examples of how farmers within the region and people within the natural resource economy sector are adapting to climate impact. So the second key message, um, so I'll just go over this briefly. Climate change and extreme events are already endangering the well-being of a wide range of wildlife, fish, and plants which are intimately tied to tribal subsistence culture and popular outdoor recreation activities. Climate change is projected to continue to have adverse impacts on the regional environment with implications for values, identity, heritage, cultures, and the quality of life of the region's diverse populations. Adaptation and informed management, especially culturally appropriate strategies, will likely increase the resilience of the region's natural capital. So again, uh, we detailed the linkage between observed and regional risks. Essentially, all of the climate impacts will impact iconic species of the Northwest, including game species, deer and elk, um, and also many of the traditional foods that tribes are dependent on, including salmon, trees, different types of trees, water, roots, and berries. Um, recreational opportunities, such as harvesting shellfish will decline, um, as well as opportunities for water-based recreation due to low stream flow and uh, declining snowpack. Um, and despite the level uh, future projections of uh, how water-based recreation, the demand for those recreation activities will likely increase because of the warmer weather and summers. 
Here again, this figure just demonstrates how some traditional foods, such as the salmon, are key and inherently tied to many Northwest tribal cultures. I um, mean, this is specifically the first salmon ceremony uh, from the Puyallup tribe here in Washington state. Um, and this is the ceremony uh, conducted when the first salmon is caught of the year. And again, um, there's a lot of projections for future climate change, but the, uh, the general conclusion for this key message is that climate change projections in the future under all scenarios will exacerbate what has already happened in terms of its impacts to iconic species, such as game species, wolverines, salmon. Um, it will impact cultures dependent uh, and communities dependent on these natural resources, such as tribes and the recreational outdoor community. And then again, there are challenges and opportunities for reducing risk and emerging issues. Um, and so these slides will also be available if you wanted to dig into each of these points and the associated citations and references afterwards, um, after the webinar. So the third key message is focused on infrastructure. Existing water, transportation, and energy infrastructure already face challenges from flooding, landslides, drought, wildfire, and heat waves. Climate change is projected to increase the risks from many of these extreme events, potentially compromising the reliability of water supplies, hydropower, and transportation across the region. Isolated communities and those with systems that lack redundancy are the most vulnerable. Adaptation strategies that address more than one sector are coupled with social and environmental co-benefits and increased resilience. And so most of the examples that we've seen uh, with the, climate impacts to infrastructure within the Northwest region are really highlighted by extreme events. And so here are a few examples. Um, first of all, uh, road, highway, and rail closures due to flooding, failed culverts, landslides, wildfires, and sinkholes. So in 2015, with the extreme precipitation and flooding, um, parts of Oregon on the coast were completely cut off to uh, services because uh, all of their transportation lanes into their communities were cut off because of these extreme events. Um, in addition, water quality and quantity in reservoirs are going to be reduced, which impacts uh, the water system of the Northwest, and energy systems will also be adversely impacted by wildfires. Um, in addition to that, uh, specific to tribal communities, in Washington State, four of the five coastal tribal communities have already relocated uh, parts of their reservation are in the process of planning to relocate parts of the reservation due to sea level rise, coastal inundation, and erosion. And so the example most cited, cited within the region is Quinault Indian Nation are in the process of moving their lower village of Tahola to higher ground because of these issues. And again, Future climate change will only exacerbate all of the current vulnerabilities and risks uh, of the region's infrastructure, which including uh, more events that might limit transportation actions through the risk of landslides within mountain regions, sea level rise magnifying risks uh, to infrastructure along the coast, and also water availability um, in Washington state specifically. Uh, there are not a lot of redundancy within water reservoirs. And so here is a figure from Seattle City Light that really illustrates how there are multiple physical climate impacts and not a single one impacts each infrastructure system and that it's really multiple climate stressors, um, which must be kind of addressed in this like cumulative stressor type of analysis when trying to adapt to climate change impacts. Um, and so again, challenges and opportunities within the infrastructure um, system. Uh, the biggest highlight here is that one of the biggest challenges is upgrading infrastructure systems costs a lot of money. Um, and so this might be a potential opportunity to engage nature-based uh, solutions uh, in integrating emergency preparedness and response capacity for extreme events like earthquakes and tsunamis within the climate resiliency planning. 
um, essentially to try to negate some of the costs with upgrading infrastructure. Oh, and here is the uh, figure I was looking for previously. Um, and these are all of the single source water systems within Washington. So essentially that means if one of these water systems is compromised, everyone within a community dependent on one of these water systems will be vulnerable um, to those impacts. The next key message is focused on health. Um, organizations and volunteers that make up the Northwest Social Safety Net are already stretched thin with current demands. Healthcare and social systems will likely be further challenged with increasing frequency of acute events or when cascading events occur, in addition to an increased likelihood of hazards and epidemics, disruptions in local economies and food systems are projected to result in more chronic health risks. The potential health code benefits of future climate mitigation investments could help counterbalance these risks. And so really what we've seen here is that um, issues of both hospital room admissions related to extreme events such as heat, wildfire, and smoke, and also um, infectious diseases uh, such as Lyme disease, salmonella, cryptococcal infections, um, and diseases from uh, harmful algal blooms and toxins accumulating in shellfish within the region. And, uh, Within the future, obviously, many of these risks, again, will continue to exacerbate under all climate change scenarios. And uh, some of the things we wanted to highlight are some of the people most at risk include the elderly, elderly children, um, and people within communities with not as much access to health systems. And additionally, we also wanted to impact that there is most of the literature is focused on the physical health, such as infectious diseases, heat-related illnesses, but there is a growing body of literature to suggest that climate change does likely negatively affect mental health, which ranges in multiple health outcomes, uh, ranging from stress to suicide. Um, again, there are many challenges for reducing risks. We, from the literature, uh, there's a challenge of local health departments addressing environmental health hazards, um, and that there are many opportunities since there isn't currently ha happening as much for local and state health jurisdictions to do climate and health assessment plans. So integrating um, climate change with health outcomes. And again, a growing body of literature that we didn't discuss as much within the chapter, but we acknowledge that it's out there and the research is happening, is how uh, climate change will impact health outcomes of people who are homeless, including displacement and future migration within the Northwest region. So our final and last key message focuses on frontline communities. So communities on the front lines of climate change experience first and worst effects. Frontline communities in the Northwest include tribes and indigenous peoples, those most dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods and economically disadvantaged. These communities generally prioritize basic needs such as shelter, food, and transportation, frequently lack economic and political capital, and have fewer resources to prepare for and cope with climate disruptions. The social and cultural cohesion inherent in many of these communities provides the foundation for building community capacity and increasing resilience. So again, we acknowledge that there are many different types of frontline communities, and for the purposes of the NCA4, we focused on three groups as kind of these case studies, mostly because of their relevance to the Northwest and because of the body of literature that can support some of these claims. So we first focused on Northwest tribes and indigenous peoples. As I said earlier, uh, many tribes and indigenous peoples are dependent on their culture, economy, and livelihoods on natural resources, and there are a lot of cascading uh, health impacts associated with the loss of cultural and traditional resources. In addition, tribes and indigenous peoples face the historical legacy of colonization and ongoing management barriers, such as the loss of agency over managing lands um, within their uh, reservation or traditional territories. In addition, social networks and connectivity within communities can reduce the vulnerability to climate change, and efforts to preserve and strengthen these connectivity is important. In addition to this, we focus on farm workers who have also faced enhanced occupational health exposure to extreme heat, poor air quality, and droughts. Um, 
their occupational exposure combined with minimal access to wages and health care leads to higher prevalence of chronic and health acute health conditions with farm workers and that policies to protect farm workers across the region vary um, place to place and is not as well studied. Finally, low income populations in urban environments. Poor communities and communities of color specifically live in urban neighborhoods with greater exposure to climate related extreme events, such as urban heat island effect and poor air quality. In addition, a theme that's coming up is uh, unequal access or the lack of access to specific services that might enhance a community's adaptive capacity. Um, for low-income populations, it's access to transit, food options, economic mobility. Um, however, there are multiple municipalities enacting policies and governance changes to address these inequities alongside environmental concerns, um, such as the City of Seattle's plan. And Mike, so, sorry to interrupt. I, um, we're running a little long. Is it? A, are you almost there? Just yeah, so it's questions. over. So again, the author team acknowledgments. And if you want to read the entire chapter, I know this was a lot to cover um, in 20 minutes. So here's the link there for you um, to read uh, if you're interested in any of these key messages further. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Great. I'm going to actually hold off on questions so we get through Cheryl because I really uh, I think it's important to hear from her as well because the two pieces really tie in. Cheryl, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Um, the education resources that she's going to share are just going to, I think, be great. And as educators, we need that piece as well. So thank you so much, Mike. If you could stay in line, we'll see if there's questions. And if you do have questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll um, collate them as Cheryl is speaking. So thank you so much. Um, if I could just briefly here introduce Cheryl. Um, Cheryl Manning, we are so lucky to have with us. She's coming to us from DC. Um, but she is from Evergreen, Colorado. She teaches honors earth and space science, honors chemistry and AP environmental science at Evergreen High School there. But she's currently in DC serving a fellowship with the National Science Foundation, Directorate for Geosciences in the Office of the Assistant Director. And she recently created online tools for teachers to plan climate change lessons and units congruent with NGSS. And so she's going to be sharing some of those units, and I really want you all to get your eyes and ears on them because I think they could be really helpful. So thank you, Cheryl. Take it away. All right. Can you hear me okay? All right. Great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about some work that I did um, taking the Next Generation Science Standards and the Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Resource Network um, and putting those two together to create something that I hope we can all find to be helpful. Okay, so but, oh, before, oh, I don't want to end show, sorry. Um, <laughs> before I get started, I want to thank the funders of the Clean Network, uh, NSF, NOAA, Turk, uh, Department of Energy, uh, CERC is where it's hosted and Ceres manages it today. Um, okay, why can't, why doesn't that work? Can we just, sorry, I'm a Mac person and I'm working on a PC. Okay, uh, so uh, just a quick review. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, Clean is a network of people and it's also a, uh, an opportunity for some professional development as well as a collection of resources that have been vetted and reviewed by both scientists and educators around the country. And uh, working with a small group of people, I aligned the, uh, the resources to NGSS um, and they are searchable by the three dimensions, uh, keywords, resource type, and grade level. All right, so here we are. Uh, this is actually uh, just a little quick screenshot. Uh, what I did for this project was I created a uh, uh, three pieces, uh, a getting started guide, which I'll go over, uh, some videos, which are on the page, and a planning template that you can use. And we're in the process of revising that planning template to make it a little bit more coherent with uh, current research. I created three different units uh, from the Clean Collection. Uh, one is a middle school unit that focuses in on phenology or how um, biological systems uh, change and are affected by changing of seasons and how then climate uh, change affects the seasons, which then affects the, the critters and the plants. Uh, the second was a history of oceans and atmosphere, and the third is debating the grid, which is a solutions-focused um, 
uh, unit, and I'm going to dig into that one the most, I think, today. I was going to do one of the others, but I think the debating the grid is good because it's, it is solutions focused, which is something that I truly believe is important for us to be emphasizing in our classrooms. So the two things that have come about since uh, I did this work was, uh, is an increased uh, a focus on the idea of phenomenon and how these, uh, because phenomenon provide the context, phenomena are observable events that we use science to explain and predict. Uh, using uh, the, the guiding of that content area is through student questions and then um, the student's objectives are to figure out what or how, why or how something is happening, and thereby deepening their knowledge and making it more transferable to new situations. The other line of research that has um, emerged quite heavily is the idea of storylining, uh, which I am um, currently wrapping my brain around. It's a big idea. Um, teachers already do this to some degree, but it's really about making our thinking more visible to others. All right, so in, the, uh, in our new uh, resource, our new template, planning template, we have broken this down into four steps uh, where, and I'm gonna go through this um, very quickly. This is all available to you, but we're, we start by identifying some anchoring phenomenon and connect that to performance expectations. We unpack those performance expectations in, in terms of the three dimensions, the science and engineering practices the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts. We choose an instructional strategy, and we start with the assessment in mind. Then we work on the storyline component, where we think about what we're teaching, when we're teaching it, how we're teaching it, and how those things all connect to each other. We create our lesson plans, and then get to our reflection piece, uh, which as a uh, a person who's been in the classroom for over 20 years, I, I thoroughly believe that that last piece for us as teachers is one of the most important things we can be doing. Okay, let's look at what, we, what I created. So the two different resources that I created for high school specifically are a history of oceans and atmospheres, atmosphere, and this particular one is uh, the phenomenon. Uh, you could put a variety of things out there, uh, but the the thing that I uh, that I am using for the phenomenon are some graphics showing how oceans and atmos atmosphere changes. Um, how has and then thinking about how this has happened in the past, what maybe have have was the past changes, uh, the data that supports our understanding of the history, and how um, that can help us understand what's happening today. This is a high school unit. There is some uh, quantitative. Uh, pieces uh, that are engaging students in at least algebra, if not some geometry. Uh, and so having that high school level math is helpful. Uh, it is a two week unit and it's a database phenomenon. Um, I'm gonna, if I have time, I'll come back to this, but I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna get to the other one first. Um, so the second one that I created for high school is uh, uh, debating the electrical grid. Uh, and modernization of that. So while the electrical grid is uh, this amazing thing that we all take advantage of when we forget about it every day, it's critical to our lives. It is becoming aged and, and so updating it um, with some modern technology makes a lot of sense. But when we dig into what, what, how that could happen, uh, it gets to some issues of personal freedom and uh, private is, private, uh, the privacy of our data. Um, and so I wanna take a minute and just um, dive into this, see if this works. There, yay. <laughs> I'm never quite sure if it's gonna happen or not. So the debating the grid unit um, there, so which, with each of these units, first of all, let's take a look at this left-hand sidebar on the clean website. Um, this is, all of these pieces are under tools for educators. Cheryl, I don't think your screen popped over onto ours. Oh, it didn't. Like pull it okay, I'm going to stop. Here, let me do this yeah. and then start sharing again. Sorry, thank you for letting no, me okay. know. No, it's no problem. Okay, there. Now you can see my face from a couple of years ago. There you go. Um, 
<laughs> so in the left hand sidebar, there's a tools for educators. Um, here's the national climate assessment, which we were just learning about. Um, so the STEM uh, is a newsletter. And then here is the piece that I created on NGS and clean units, um, the getting started guide, the phenology, oceans and atmosphere, and we're going to look more in detail at debating the grid example. So with each of these resources, there is a video um, that you can use, uh, that you can view um, where I talk a little bit about my thinking. Um, it gives the context for you, some of the learning objectives, as well as the resources from clean that I use to create the unit. Um, let's go to this document right here. And um, it, this is just a PDF. Uh, so this is uh, a, a completed template of, the, of this particular unit. So what you'll notice is that there's um, a title, grade level, time, all the stuff that we as teachers uh, like to pay attention to. And then part one is uh, um, highlighting the, the NGSS performance expectations. The phenomenon, in this case, it's the smart grid technology and describing an overview of how the phenomenon or problem would best suit the, the performance expectation. Uh, this is a debate that students are going to have about the privacy of their data. And so I used arguments. Um, and then unpacking the uh, performance expectation. This is the first one. And I know I'm flying through this. And I'll, I'll get I'll, I'm hoping hoping to leave some time for questions. And here's unpacking um, three dash four and ETS one dash three. So these are all the different performance expectations and kind of ripping them apart, thinking about the practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross cutting concepts. Okay. Um, so for the assessment on this, we're going to, uh, we would have the students do a debate. Um, and I provide three different options for, for uh, possible rubrics you could use. Um, as an educator, you oftentimes will have to take a rubric and modify that. And so I wanted to respect that idea. Uh, create an institutional plan um, by building a storyline. So this piece of it is, starts with knowing what the students should know. And we had, I had to go all the way back to fourth grade to find those performance expectations that students should have an understanding of. Okay. Then I go through and I, um, I have the, the activities that I listed, which are just kind of a, a, tr a list of, a long list of different pieces. But I wanted to get to this part about the storyline or the timeline. Now, this is not the formal storyline model that um, you may see uh, from the current research, um, and I'm in the process of modifying these to kind of fit into that, that idea. So in week one, students learn a little bit about electricity, where it comes from, and, and how that varies by region. And that's a really important component, especially when we're looking at the National Climate Assessment piece. This gives students an opportunity to see how different resources are more available in different regions and how those regions should be looking at those available resources to update their grid technology. Students learn about how electricity is generated and they also have a chance to do some um, group discussions. Um, the next piece of this, oops, I jumped through, here we go. The next piece of this is, um, is then comparing their region with another region in the United States and looking at how um, those, how, how different types of energy resources provide different amounts and different types of what we, what we call quality of energy. Is it dependent upon weather? Is it dependent upon the time of day? Or is it something that we can rely on 24 seven? Students examine, um, oh, come on, sorry. Students um, examine uh, where uh, the waste of energy, so energy efficiency, thinking a little bit about entropy, and um, then apply that same idea to the regional construct. Um, finally, uh, 
students begin to identify sustainable energy solutions for their region. So each in, in my class, what I did is I had um, different groups of kids focus on different regions around the around the, the country and think about how those different regions could make the most of what they have in terms of sustainable energy solutions. They apply that to a smart grid technology, which uh, reaches around the country and um, develop a sense of the pros and cons of a smart grid, uh, in, in, instituting a smart grid uh, structure. We have a whole class discussion, which is really form, formulated as a debate. Um, student participation could be assessed at that point. Um, that debate um, is students all come in with the same level of understanding of the topics. They don't know which side of the debate they're going to be on. Uh, they end up with uh, uh, having to debate from different perspectives and different um, uh, different ideas or different um, um, stakeholders is the word I'm looking for, sorry. Uh, so different stakeholders. And that maybe would be a, a group grade. And then uh, an individual assessment gives uh, students an opportunity to write from the heart and from their own thinking. And that would be the, the final assessment for this, um, creating a one-page evidence-based argument advocating for or against the development and um, of a smart grid for themselves and if they would want to participate in that. Um, and then finally, within this template, you'd have that, that unit reflection. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this page and go back to my slides. How am I doing on time? Nine minutes. Okay, I'm not going to take all that. So that is a solutions-focused um, uh, activity. The other activity that I have is more from the perspective of the geological or earth sciences. Um, and this one is uh, uh, much more detailed and students are doing a lot of different things. And there is uh, an opportunity to do a jigsaw activity in this. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I did, wanted to, I did want to take a moment to talk about that. So the next steps for uh, these units that, that I've worked on is to convert them over to um, a modified storyline style, but something that's a little bit more manageable for teachers. I'm also in the process of creating some units um, based off of some work that I've done around um, uh, climate impacts of climate on agriculture and water quality, and so thinking about it more from that environmental perspective. And I believe that's it. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Did I stop sharing? OK, that should have worked. Yep, you're, okay. all on, you're on chart. Sorry. OK. I'm, I couldn't unmute. I know that was really fast. And, and so if uh, people are interested, I could, um, I'm happy to share my contact information again. Um, I can do that in the chat box. And uh, if you have questions, uh, you're welcome to get in touch with me anytime. So I'll share that right here. Great. Are there any questions that um, people have that we could bring forward now at the end? Anyone? Uh, <clears throat> hey, Mike. Uh, unless, unless somebody else has got one, I thought yes. one that might be useful, but okay. I'll, I'll wait. I'm not seeing any other ones. So, you know, one, one thing, one thing that Mike, um, I thought, ah, yes, I see you, Deb. Um, uh, before we get to that, the, the idea of scenarios. And the difference between those scenarios is how much carbon emissions humanity removes and how quickly we do it versus, you know, and that has how much impact. Um, but we didn't really see that in your talk. Um, can, you, can you just describe a little bit about the kind of the way you guys are thinking about, you know, limiting the amount of impact through carbon emissions relative to what you were seeing in the Northwest? Uh, we can't hear you, Mike. Um, you're still muted. Yeah. All right, can you hear me now? Yep. Sure um, so uh, just let me uh, restate so I understand the question. Um, 
talk in uh, talking specifically within the Northwest, how much kind of uh, carbon mitigation is happening? No, no, the opposite. Or, uh, or the op meaning like what what would it, it, if we did a lot globally to to reduce the you know carbon emissions would what kind of impacts would we be looking at if we did not much or we just kept on going as we've been what kind of impacts would you know the difference between if there's some choices and that's really yeah. what i was trying to get at yeah so um so i guess in terms of the emissions kind of like the the broad at the broad scale the emission scenario specifically talked about were kind of business as usual so kind of if no action was taken about carbon mitigation um, uh, and then kind of like a low emission scenario like if some carbon mitigation was happening and also a high emission scenario so kind of like is about the growth of in terms of scenario uh, if not only are we not mitigating but the growth of fossil fuel and fossil fuel expenses continuing um, at the current growth rates and so uh, Generally, um, most of these impacts that we've already seen because of uh, what is currently in the atmosphere, what is currently stored um, within the ocean, uh, many of the carbon storage things, a lot of these impacts, if uh, we stopped emitting carbon tomorrow, will still, be will still continue to happen, mostly because of the lag time it takes for uh, carbon to both Kind of disappear from that system uh, and you might know more specifically about the science of this because um, but essentially when we kind of say impacts are projected to continue to exacerbate oftentimes that's across all of these scenarios and so it's kind of talking about the level of specificity about for example about heat related deaths um, that is currently happened, that's going to continue to projecting to happen because we're kind of already on this path where we're going to see more extreme heat events. But if we don't do any more carbon, addressing carbon emissions specifically, then uh, all of that will continue to compound and exacerbate under high emission scenarios or low emission scenarios um, versus if everything stopped. Okay. And then Deb, you also had a question about uh, Mike, your work in the tribal community where you work. Can you describe a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so um, my work with the Macaw is specifically uh, around trying to integrate climate change planning uh, across all the departments. So specifically, it initially started as me working within the natural resource departments, working with uh, kind of fisheries, forestry, habitat on how do we try to uh, integrate climate change planning and accounting for specific impacts of climate change within management plans. And now that is obviously kind of cascaded because again, um, I'm sure from your earlier webinar, when within a tribal community specifically, talking about climate impacts to the environment and natural resources often have more than just an environmental and natural resource scope. It's very much a cultural community-based scope. So now it's kind of reaching out from not just the natural resource departments, but how do we integrate climate change planning with uh, the tribal clinic, um, the different types of stores, restaurants um, on the reservation, how do we integrate it within uh, cultural uh, teachings, activities through the museum and public works and infrastructure and trying to approach it from more of this holistic lens of climate resilience rather than just from a natural resource-based lens. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Looks like we only have a few. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions folks had? We could, you know, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, well, thank you so much to all of you for joining. Um, as you leave the webinar, a survey will pop up. So please take the time to take that. It really helps us out. Um, we want to say once again, many, many thanks to Mike and Cheryl for joining us today and to Washington um, to inviting us to pull this together. And um, I hope you all have a lovely end of your day and end of February. Uh, there'll be an email follow up with all the resources mentioned and links to this webinar as well as the past webinars as well. So thank you. And if you have any follow up questions, please be in touch with me and I can connect you with um, the folks that can answer your question or try and do that as well. 
Um, and yes, Deb, we will stay on following webinar. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, you all. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We'll talk to you later. Thank you again.